You may not find Pierce, Parnell, Emmett, or O'Connell, but only the color of the nameplate and the use of Rue, Plas, and Coor shows that we're not in Cork or Galway, or even in Ireland. We are, in fact, on the banks of the Garonne River and in the city of Bordeaux in southwestern France, where Sullivan, McCarthy, O'Quinn, Mitchell, Kirwan, Barton, Lynch, Boyd, Clark, Dillon and Phelan are more Gaelic than Gallic and, one would think, hardly native to this department as Pontac and Sigur would be. But what wonderful things did these Irish families do and when to have places named after them? This is a tale of enterprise and wealth. Its heroes are Irish families who left home and made their fortunes in another land in another time. It's the story of the Irish wine merchants of Bordeaux, the paddy factor of Aquitaine. Modern Bordeaux is an elegant and spacious city. For 300 years from the 12th century, Bordeaux was ruled by the Crown of England, and it was during this time that a serious wine trade with Ireland began to develop in exchange for salt beef, butter and hides. So it's likely that Irish immigrants were familiar with this trade when they arrived in the 17th and 18th centuries. Of the merchant families with Irish surnames established at this time, many continue to be prominent in the wine business after nearly three centuries. The Barton dynasty in Bordeaux was founded when Tom Barton left the Waterfoot, the family holding on the north shore of Loch Erne in County Fermanagh. The Bartons eventually settled at Chateau Leoville Barton in Saint Julien, some 20 miles outside Bordeaux, where the family continues to produce some of the most celebrated wines of the locality, Chateau Leoville Barton and Chateau Langua Barton. Many of Dublin's landmarks are the work of Francis Johnson, whose granduncle William founded one of the wealthiest and largest family-owned wine companies in Bordeaux, still managed by seventh and eighth generation Johnstons. The Lawtons of Lake Marsh between Skibbereen and Bally de Hob in West Cork gravitated towards the city. Hugh Lawton became sheriff and then Lord Mayor of Cork. Abraham went a, a long way from the land to found the most respected wine brokerage in Bordeaux. Just as the Lawton line has died out in West Cork, many of the immigrant Irish families have petered out in Bordeaux, leaving only their names indelibly etched on elegant premises or on labels of the celebrated products of the region. Families like McCarthy, Lynch, Kirwan, Barrett and Phelan. Names from Ireland also adorned the brandy area 90 kilometers away in Cognac, Delamain, Exshaw, and Hennessy among them. In the Loire Valley, the Marquis de Goulain can number among his ancestors countless distinguished immigrant Irish. Many families left Ireland after the Cromwellian persecution or fled to France after the Battle of the Boyne and the Siege of Limerick to join the army of James II. These were romantically called the Wild Geese. Others left the armies and settled in Bordeaux. They play the principal roles in this saga about families who preferred mammon to marching. The merchants and farmers who left Ireland around the same time settled in Bordeaux and secured commanding positions in the claret trade. These we have called the wine geese. It's for them that the streets and chateau are named and the descendants of some of them continue to be unusually influential in the wine business, seven, sometimes nine generations later. But Bordeaux means more than wine today. Other topics engage the attention and acumen of the busy Bordelais, the manufacture and fabrication of carbon fiber, high-tech plastics, electronics and ceramics, advanced aerospace developments and sports equipment, combined with the more traditional industries derived from the timber growing of Lalande to create an energetic and outward-looking business community which carries on as if Paris doesn't exist. But in the inner city, there's no escape from the nature of the principal product, the main preoccupation. The wine business is complex and entails much pressing of the flesh. The product passes through many hands before arriving on the dining table. The business model is something like this. The farmers who are the chateau owners grow the grapes and make the wine. 
For a small commission, the brokers or courtiers arrange for the various growers to sell their produce into the Bordeaux markets to the merchants or negocios. These, in turn, sell on to the domestic and export markets. Oog Lawton is a merchant or negocio. The Lawtons established themselves in the aristocracy of the Cork as a broking family, as middlemen. Oog, however, developed a distinguished career as an international merchant with a particular interest in Ireland and a great sense of his Irishness. Today, he wouldn't look out of place at Skibbereen Market. By the time Bordeaux was regained from England in 1453, it was a walled city protected by toll gates. Inside the walls, a jumble of Roman streets and medieval lanes, many fossilized into the contemporary streetscape. Outside, on the downstream slablands, in an area reserved for lepers and foreigners, many of the Irish settled and set up their businesses, among them Abraham Lawton from Cork. It's perhaps hard to grasp the relative ease with which the well-connected Irish could travel back and forth to France and the size of the trade between the two countries. From early times, huge shipments of wine left Bordeaux for Ireland. One season alone, a million and a half litres were shipped to Cork, Kinsale and other seaports in Ireland. In modern terms, that's a bottle for everyone in the country. By the time the Irish were established in Bordeaux, Bishop Barclay of Cloyne had cause to remark, in England, many a gentleman with a thousand pounds a year never drink wine in their houses. In Ireland, this could hardly be said of anyone who has a hundred pounds a year. Oog Lawton explains the importance of the sighting of Bordeaux to merchantmen in the days of sale. This is the Garonne River. It's one of the largest rivers in this country. And if Bordeaux is Bordeaux, it is because the Garonne River flows through Bordeaux. It is a tidal river, very far away from the Atlantic, 80 kilometers roughly, and it was the first shelter that you could find when coming from the estuary. There was the possibility of anchoring, and there was no other place. Today, the harbor is absolutely empty of any ship, but in the 18th century and the 19th century, it was absolutely busy with activity. There were plain embankments and the barrels, the, the casks of wine to be shipped were simply rolled over the quays and down to the embankment uh, to barges where they were loaded and uh, on, then on the ships. And if there was an unloading problem because the, the ships also were bringing wines from the various ports of the Medoc, uh, the barrels were unloaded from the ships on barges and came to the embankment and then to the cellars of the, of the wine merchants in Bordeaux. The Quai des Chartrons, which is behind me, is world famous. It was called the Quai des Chartrons because there used to be a convent of the Chartres friars prior to the 17th century. And as the foreigners were allowed to be there, the governors of the province managed to get the friars of the Chartres out. But it was still called the Chartres area. But as the foreigners could not pronounce properly the Chartres name, they called it Chartron or Chartreuse. And finally, it became Chartron. This very rundown area, which became a very wealthy district with beautiful architecture, and where the foreigners who had arrived here uh, like adventurers and probably without very much money, finally took their revenge over life and over perhaps the people of Bordeaux. 500 sea miles from Ireland, the Gironde, the combined estuary of the Garonne and Dordogne, is unusual in that it flows north into the Atlantic. The Medoc, with the familiar wine communes, is on the same side as Bordeaux City. The rivers really are formidable, wide and fast flowing, and so daunting that the Romans considered them as seas, and the peninsula at their confluence is still known as Entre du Mer, between the two seas. But the river also played a key role in the economic development of the wine business, as the highway by which the wines of the Medoc were brought up river to the cellars of the proud Bordeaux merchants. Along the banks are the remnants of little harbours where the casks were rolled onto barges, fulfilling the wine's initial transaction arranged by brokers, the traditional role of the Lawton family. Daniel, deputy mayor of Bordeaux and the seventh generation proprietor of Tastet and Lawton. 
Uh, I'm a broker, a, a wine broker. The wine broker is, a, as I can explain, a middleman. I am, um, we are not buying for ourselves. We are um, organizing the sale between the uh, produ uh, producer, the chateaus, and the wine shippers in, in Bordeaux. The names of the chateau and shippers are familiar, but the brokers who arrange the deals between the two are low profile. This discreet middleman role is tailor-made for the descendants of West Cork Protestant farming stock. The order is the producers, the brokers, and then the wine shippers of Bordeaux or of the area of Bordeaux. And then they sell to the wine merchants in Ireland, in England, in uh, Germany or in the United States, everywhere. In our office, we have very good uh, archives. And uh, this book is uh, one of the older we have. This was 200 years ago, in uh, 1789. And they, they buy very good wines. Uh, I see a, 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 a transaction, a sale with Lafitte. Uh, Lafitte, Aubryon, Margot, Mouton, etc. And the, the buyers were foreigners and very often Irish. Uh, the Connor family, Clark, Galway, Byrne, uh, Lynch, uh, Boyd, for Boy, Boyd Cantenac, Dillon, uh, now the Chateau Dillon, uh, Skinner, Barton, Barton, the very famous family, Barton, uh, Johnston, uh, Barry, McCarthy. McCarthy, we were very close to our family, McCarthy, Lawton married McCarthy. Across seven generations, the Lawtons married into other influential wine families and became the only brokers to be accepted by the elitist Chartronnet and to share the benefits from an emerging new beverage. Oog Lawton's own mother is a Deleuze and he analyzes the revolutionary product. The wine trade was emerging as something uh, uh, brilliantly new uh, in the second part of the 17th century and the beginning of the 18th century. The wine produced at, uh, in the Middle Age period was not the wine that we know today. There were no particular research for quality. There was no limit in the production. Therefore, the vineyards were producing a lot of wine. As a, as a result, a wine that was very clear in color. And the French called it le vin clairé, which means the clear wine. And le vin clairé, as the English couldn't pronounce properly clairé, they called it claret. And this is why Bordeaux wine is still known today as being claret. Thanks to, very often, the research made by foreigners, the Dutch, the Germans, the Irish, and the English, and many experiments showed that by keeping the wine in wood for some time and aging it, you produce better wines. But you had the necessity of racking the wine. Racking the wine means to change from one cask to another and eliminate the sediment each time. Bottles also were produced uh, in a cheaper way, and uh, bins were produced to accommodate these, these bottles, while beforehand it was impossible to bin bottles of wine because of their shape. Uh, a very important uh, thing was the, the use of cork. The cork allows uh, only a very, very slow exchange between uh, the wine and the outside atmosphere, uh, which allows uh, an, oxidation, an oxidation, but a slight oxidation, uh, which makes the wine mature and live. Uh, so the, the cork was a, a, a great factor. So all these elements combined led to a product, a wine of quality, and known as the new French carrot. So this was an attraction to foreigners because it was a, new, a brand new product and a product with which you could make money. What is very interesting is to see that all these people coming from various countries and particularly from Ireland uh, arrived here with nothing, with no wealth at all. And in a matter of a few years uh, were very wealthy people. And uh, you may consider the Lynches, you may consider the Kerwins, all these people had their estates, and they had beautiful mansions built everywhere. And the traders in the Chartron area 
had uh, houses built by the best architects in a matter of uh, 20 years of existence in Bordeaux. Uh, so it shows that the business was extremely profitable. Probably more profitable than we can think of today, because today it would be impossible to, to make such a wealth in such little time. Today's new rich could not emulate the style of the immigrant Irish and their friends and marital relatives in the Chartron area. Madame Simon Lawton, mother of Daniel and Oog, can transport us back to the Chartron lifestyle at the turn of the century. You see, in Bordeaux, the old people who live in Bordeaux were not so very pleased to see all those foreigners coming. And so they put them out of the town in, uh, in the place called Charton, Les Chartons. So all our families were more or less always dining and uh, in the, always together, and so of course they married. My husband was a cousin of myself, and so I always knew him. But it was a dinner at my uncle, Mr. Gaetier, when I was uh, 16, and, uh, well, I, I fall in love. He was interested in everything, and he was, uh, uh, he loved the, when he was quite young, well, he uh, did his studies. He didn't work so beautifully well, perhaps, because he was very interested in shooting and tennis. He was a very good taster. He tasted wine beautifully well. He was one of the famous brave brokers of Bordeaux. You saw him tasting the wine and, <laughs> and spitting it out. And he was, uh, well, he was very popular. Everybody loved him very much. One day, after the last war, uh, General came for lunch here. And who came? It was Monsieur Chabon Delmas, now the Lord Mayor of Bordeaux. And they stayed two after lunch. They talked together for two hours here in that little room. And uh, he, they fell. Uh, they, they were very great friends. Apart, they were the same opinion on everything. And M. Chabon Delmas, when he comes here, he always says, here, everything began. And M. Chabon Delmas had great confidence in him. And whatever my husband asked to do for the town, well, he did. As well as the intense business and politics of the city life of the Chartonnet, there were also the more leisurely spells in the grandeur of the chateau. In the summer, we used to go to Pavey. Pavey was where my grandmother was, Madame Francis de Luz. She was very gay, and uh, in the evening after dinner, she used to put herself at the piano, and she played the piano, and we were all dancing, and we had a very joyful life, very agreeable. And uh, when I was married, I was there with my children a long time. One year, when Daniel was born at Pavey, we went there in June, and we came back only in December. It was a very easy life. But the easy shadow life is a thing of the past. To maintain even a modest property, the proprietors have the busy and arduous life of all farmers. In his role as merchant, Oog Lawton keeps an eye on the mechanized harvesting in this property in Ante du Mer. In my job of wine merchant, it is very important that apart from selling wine, I be in touch with the growers, particularly at the time of the vintage, because I want to uh, inform my own customers about uh, uh, what's going on, what they can expect. Uh, and today, I come and see Philippe Le Gris de la Salle, the owner of Chateau Le Grand Verdu, because it's a chateau, it's an estate uh, that I have been selling for many years. I've been selling this label to lots of customers uh, outside of France. So I come and visit uh, to know uh, how the picking is uh, successful or not, and what we can expect in quality. And monitoring quality and emphasis on quality is the key to Bordeaux's success. Oog, the merchant assessing the harvest, Daniel the broker assessing the aging of the wine. So we have the bouquet, the color is normal, deep. So it's, uh, and now it's interesting to appreciate it. You just take not too much.
moutons. And this vine-to-wine -wine care for quality, which we shall see step by step as we meet each of the Irish families and their various professions, ensures a product which is a highly prized international commodity. Pierre Patrick Lawton does not have cellars or warehouses stocked with wine. He buys and sells wine as a commodity like any other, often without seeing it, but brilliantly informed on the respective qualities of the wines of each chateau and each vintage in which he specializes. I am the eighth generation of Lawtons in the wine trade, and uh, I was brought to the pleasure of wine uh, at a very early stage because the day I was born, Dad brought a bottle of good claret, I understand, to the clinic, opened it, and I was granted a sip of wine that day, and Daddy finished the bottle, unfortunately. But uh, I guess it was not an unpleasant experience because. Uh, when I grew older, I immediately uh, got to love wine. What we are doing here is trying to take advantage of difference in rate between foreign markets and the border market. So this company was created a year and a half ago with the idea to treat really wine like a commodity. To take an example, uh, the pressure uh, when a wine is released on the market is initially, as it's natural, on the border market because any customer will have uh, the natural reaction to question Bordeaux when he wants to buy fine wines, which eventually leads the Bordeaux market to climb very quickly. Uh, we try to spot those wines which have been bought early by foreign customers from other markets, such as the London market, where the pressure is not such to arbitrate uh, difference in prices. And in some cases, in currencies. Uh, last uh, month, for example, the Swiss franc uh, went down a bit. And using these machines, we managed to take advantage of this because we spotted wines which were clearly cheaper than they were in Bordeaux. Our activity is exporting wines on a daily basis. We sell in 12 different markets to a wide range of customers who are uh, traditional stockholders, who sell to the restaurant trade, private customers, but who might always have an excess of stock, which is one good source of information. So we enter all their lists in our computers, and when we're looking for a specific wine, for example, we'll uh, question our databases, extract those customers who are suppliers in this case, who have the wine, and convert it in French francs at today's rate. That's very quick, very simple. Pierre Patrick may make wine transactions sound very simple, but it's very difficult for the layman to make an informed choice when confronted by row upon row of exotically labelled bottles, even if some of the names are familiar. In later programmes, we'll be picking our way through the wines on offer from the main wine geese chateau, but it's worth remembering that, for the most part, the wines of Bordeaux, particularly the younger wines, are intended as a beverage to accompany food. Madame Micheline Lawton, wife of Oug Lawton and mother of Pierre Patrick, gives an insight into how to relate the contents of the glass and the plate. For myself, not being born in Bordeaux, when I came here, the first surprise was to see and discover that the food was not something so important. What's important is the wine. And even myself, having married a Bordeaux wine negociant, when we are entertaining guests, I always ask, what are the wines you're going to give for the dinner? And then I get organized for the menu. But the wines come first. Some dishes you never give, like asparagus, because what can you drink with asparagus? Only water. And when you go to a dinner party in one of the chateaus, I was very astonished to discover that traditionally you have a little menu in a nice little card put on the table. But the food was not written on the menu. Only the wines we were going to have are written on the menu. So the food, traditionally in Bordeaux, is not so elaborate, not to kill or to interfere with the flavor of the wines. For instance, you would give duck aiguillette, magret as it is called. This is rather new, I would say new French cuisine, because the magret were not used so much in the old days. It's very thin slices of duck, of duck breast, and it's generally given with a little bit of foie gras, 
just cooked, not overdone, but very little cooked on both sides with a little sauce made generally with salt and, and green grapes. And this has not too much flavor. It's a very delicate flavor. Goes on very well with the Medoc wines. For instance, today we have wonderful Medoc wines. One of them is Du Cru Beaucaillou. This is a chateau that was owned by an Irish family, the Johnstons, very well known. And the most famous of the Irish families established in Bordeaux because it goes back to so many, so many years two centuries or even more, are the Bartons. And this is a bottle of Chateau Leoville Bartons. The Bartons still own Chateau Leoville Bartons, and actually it's Anthony Bartons with the head of the chateau. So this is really very typical of a very nice Bordeaux meal. Excellent Médoc and Magret de Canard with foie gras. And this will be our next stop, Anthony Barton's Chateau Langua in the Médoc and the fabulous harvest of The vineyards of the Medoc, north of Bordeaux, on the banks of the Gironde. This landscape has little of the charm or variety to be found in other great wine areas of France. It's featureless and formed from gravels washed down by the rivers, but it's precisely this, the coarse, highly mineralized soil, which contributes to the character of the clarets of the Medoc. Before the Irish arrived, the Dutch had tamed and drained the area. Water from the land was channeled into ditches known locally as Jal, and the network of these formalized the landscape by bounding the communes, a kind of Gallic version of an Irish townland or parish. The Jal empty into the Gironde, often at the small ports used to load the wine casks for their voyage upstream to the merchants on the Quai de Chartres in Bordeaux. The port at Béchevel in the commune of Saint-Julien is classic. A straight path from the chateau and its outbuilding, its shea, down which oxen or mules drag the casks of claret for rolling down the mud banks and loading onto the Bordeaux-bound barges. The drained reclaimed land was ideal for the right local formula of mixed farming. One third fodder crops for the draft animals, one third vine growing for wine, and one-third woodland to produce timber stakes to support the vines. The best wines come from undernourished grapes. Vine roots grow deep into these unpromising gravels, picking up moisture and trace elements. The pebbles heat up quickly in the morning and cool slowly in the evening, and this is good for ripening. Vines must see the river, is an old Madoc saying and the best vineyards seem to share this characteristic, gently sloping eastwards and catching the morning sun. The climate of Bordeaux is moderated by the sea, but each vineyard has its own individual microclimate with shaded corners or foggy hollows subtly modifying the quality of the grapes. The best vineyards in the Medoc are concentrated in a relatively small area, 
10 kilometers wide and 40 kilometers long, with villages punctuating the featureless agricultural landscape. The villages lack some of the character usually associated with this kind of French settlement, but there was only a track through the Medoc until the 19th century, and medieval communities tended to gather along the river bank close to their main means of communication. In style and architecture, these little service villages are far removed from the grandeur, indeed the flamboyance, of the other feature of the Madoc landscape, the chateau. Chateau with grace like Latour. The elegant Chateau Lafitte Rothschild. A Johnson connection, Chateau Lascombe. The modest McCarthy residence, once the focus for huge estates. Chateau of all styles and none, and chateau concocted from exotic architecture and imported stone. At some time, nearly 50 chateaux were connected with the Irish, who derived in 18th century Bordeaux, the centre of the claret trade. Nowadays, the dynasty founded by Tom Barton is the only Irish family that's been in continuous occupation of the same chateau in the Madoc since the early days. Tom Barton was born of Fermanagh farming stock in 1695 on the wooded northern shores of Loch Erin, just on the Donegal boundary. The Barton home was the Waterfoot, an unpretentious farmhouse now owned by the Barton Lone family. Inside, wine iconography is everywhere. The linked crests of the Bartons and the Johnson family in plaster work and the great motives executed after the Bartons were established successfully in Bordeaux and had expanded to acquire their first wine estate at Saint Estef, far down river in the Madoc, Chateau Le Bosque. By the time French Tom, as he was called, had died, he'd amassed a huge fortune and had many estates in France and Ireland. But it was his grandson and partner, Hugh, who made the most astute acquisition with the beautiful Chateau Langua and part of the adjoining estate of Leerville. Langua and Leerville Barton are now the property of Anthony Barton, one of the most progressive and successful winemakers of the locality and himself born in Straffan House in County Kildare. I think the Irish have always been inclined, sadly, to leave their, their native land anyway. Um, they had big families. I mean, our family was certainly, um, I think, five in that generation. So maybe he, uh, French Tom, was the first who came to this part of the world. And he probably didn't have very much to do in Ireland. I don't think he came to, to Bordeaux with the um, set intent of setting himself up as a wine merchant. I think he came possibly for general trading. And it ended up being, being wine. And um, he based his life here. The family of fortune certainly fluctuated enormously. Thomas's son was William. He, I don't think, was very hard working. And I think he appreciated the product more than um, he did um, hard work. But fortunately for us, his son, Hugh, was the one who really put the, um, the family back on the map. He actually wrote every year to his wife, estimating what his, um, his wealth was. And in 1845 or something like that, he estimated 650,000 pounds which is a lot of money in those days, a big fortune. But it wasn't all in this property or even in the, the properties in Ireland. As far as I remember, the um, Straffan house was about um, 60, 70,000 pounds. This was estimated about 40 or 50. So he had a lot of um, investments elsewhere. And uh, we think he was involved in a lot of um, other commercial activities. But wine was obviously his, his main interest. Um, strange enough, he got into difficulties during the revolution. And difficulties is something of a euphemism. Hugh was thrown into prison. Local folklore has it that he escaped dressed as a woman, taking the key of the guillotine with him. However he escaped, Hugh did what any Irishman might do in the circumstances. He went home to his mother, the beautiful Grace Massey, at the family Tipperary estate, The Grove, a few miles from Feathered, below Slevenamon. It was during this absence from France that a remarkable friendship developed, which was to transform itself into one of the most respected business names in the wine world, B and G. The friendship was between the Irish Bartons and the French Gettiers. This most remarkable relationship 
is traced by Gettier descendant Guy Sheeler. My great, 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 great grandfather was Daniel Gettier, who came from Brittany and bought property in uh, Saint-Onge, close to Bordeaux, and he was a sailor. He went through his uh, different uh, degrees, became a captain with his own ships, and he also had ships who sailed to India, where they used to bring back to Bordeaux sugar, indigo, and all kinds of uh, 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 things like those. Um, and he made a lot of money doing this job until he bought Chateau Bataille. That was a wine property, and he ran Bataille very well, made a lot of money, and was extremely wealthy. He bought also part of the Pavé de Chartron, that was part of, of the Chateau Trompette, a fort built by one of the French kings to avoid British invasions. During the French Revolution, Barton had to quit the country, and Daniel Gatier took care <coughs> of all Barton's businesses. And Barton was absolutely quiet because he had entire confidence in Daniel Gatier, and he knew very well that after the war would be ended, that Daniel Gatier and himself would get to uh, an official agreement, and they both would start interesting business where the wine trade is concerned. I think it's interesting to emphasize the fantastic friendship between the Bartons, the Gatiers, and the Johnstons, especially the Barton and the Gatiers, as Anthony Barton still lives in Chateau Langlois, which was bought by French Tom. I still live in the house that was bought by Daniel Gatier in Bordeaux. During the French Revolution, Gatier handled all the business, all Barton's business and his own. And during World War II, another Daniel Gatier handled all the Barton and Gatier business on behalf of Ronald Barton, who was with the Free French in Africa. My uncle Ronald Barton inherited from um, his father in um, 1929. He had already been living here for five years at that stage. And um, I think in the early days, um, he was much more occupied in the running of Barton Gatier for the simple reason that was a much more profitable end of the business. Than, than running a vineyard, which sad. I mean, during the 1930s, uh, there were only two acceptable vintages. Um, there was big economic upheaval, particularly in France, and the big um, devaluation of the franc at about the time one of the good vintages appeared on the market was the 1934. So even that, I don't think, actually brought in much money. So uh, I think it'd be fair to say that he hung on to the property because he loved it and because he respected the tradition whereby the family was still here. But Barton Gatier was his main activity. He had to leave, uh, leave Bordeaux in, in 1940, when the, the occupying forces arrived. And uh, he came back here not knowing quite what sort of state he was going to find the property. It was very neglected, but possibly not as bad as some people might have thought. For example, the house was um, occupied by the Germans, and although Obviously, army hobnail boots didn't exactly improve the, the parquet floor. There was no willful damage done, and there's no question of throwing chairs out of the window or burning the Louis XV furniture. So from that point of view, we were very lucky. We obviously made wine during the war, and in fact, some very good vintages, or very acceptable vintages. I mean, 1943 and 44 were, were very good. And of course, there was the a vintage that I often refer to as the, the miracle of 1945 although it was obviously harvested after the end of the war. It was, it was almost born during the war years and suffering from the effects of all those years of occupation. And yet it was one of the best wines that's been made here or, or anywhere in the Medoc for, for a long, long, long time. Just after the war, Ronnie took a rather different path to many other proprietors who decided the best way was to make a, a clean sweep, pulled up what remains of the vines and replant. He always believed, quite rightly so, that the uh, old vines produced the best wine. So he preserved as many as he could of the old vines and um, just replaced the wines that had died out with, uh, with younger vines. And um, those um, vintages produced here immediately after the war were some of the best Levy Barton that um, were ever made, 45, 47, 48, 49, 50, 52, 53. 
fantastic wines. By the 50s, B&G dominated the North American market, and Ronald Barton and Danny Gettier sold a half interest, and eventually the company passed out of their control. The historic property and the Pave de Chartres were vacated. All the activities of B&G have now been concentrated in a new depot at Blancfort. Not as romantic as the Pave de Chartres, perhaps, but more cost-effective, certainly. Neither family is involved here now, and all the Barton wine activities are conducted from Langua. The male Gettier line expired with the death of Danny in an accident. The other half of this partnership, Ronald Barton, died quietly in the gardens of his beloved Langua in 1986. Anthony Barton, like his uncle Ronald before him, views his ownership of Chateau Langua as a kind of trusteeship. With the exception of the Rothschilds, no other family has held continuous ownership of a Madoc wine property for so long. Three generations tends to be the limit, and the fact that the family is an Irish one lends added pride to the achievement. Before taking over the properties, Anthony was a negocio, a wine merchant, with his own business. This is now run by his daughter Lillian, who also participates in the complex range of deliberations and tasks associated with growing the vine and making and marketing the wine. Like any farm enterprise, wine growing is a relentless cycle of activity in preparation for the harvest. Early in the year, there's ploughing and scuffling. Vines are pruned and the spurs carefully trained. Throughout the growth period, there are pests and diseases, and it takes an array of specifics and weird machinery to cope with all the grubs and worms and moths, moles, mildews, rots and other afflictions. With such a sensitive crop and so many hazards to overcome, the verdant, full-fruited harvest is a miracle. In Langua Barton, 70% of the harvest is Cabernet Sauvignon, imparting good aging qualities, tannin and aromas to the wine. 15% of the grapes are high-yielding, soft-skinned Merlot, prone to rot but adding delicacy. The balance of the crop is Cabernet Franc, which brings clarity of colour and a beautiful bouquet, and Petit Verdot, a dark, thick-skinned grape which ripens slowly and imparts body and a peppery, spicy taste to the blend. Suddenly, it's harvest time, the Vendange. Buses rumble through the dawn, bringing pickers to begin their back-breaking work. All the picking at Barton's is done by hand. A machine can do the work of 50 pickers, and it's a very difficult job to assemble a sizable team at a moment's notice. In the heat of the September sunshine, experienced pickers select the bunches which are just right. While machines are not so discerning, Anthony Barton believes it's only a matter of time before their use is universal. The Vendange is a tense time for proprietors. Anything can go wrong. Obviously, the closer you get to the, the harvest time, the more anxious one gets. And this particular year is um, very much a case in question because as time progressed, we realized we had the potential of making one of the best uh, vintages of many, many years. It can all be ruined in, um, in a very short space of time, a big hailstorm or, or even um, a lot of rain. And this has been known in the past, 1976, for example, we had a lot of rain that ruined what was potentially a great vintage. This year, we are um, all set to uh, make a great, great harvest. I'm convinced of that. It's a combination, obviously, of the, the weather pattern we've had throughout the season. Um, the flowering went well, and we had um, the right amount of rain at the right time, and we've got a lovely um, sunny period now. It's almost as though um, the good God answered our prayers, but we haven't finished picking yet. Noontime and relief from stooping and sweating for the pickers. A noisy camaraderie and the raucousness of an outing breaks out as the bus wends its way to Chateau Langua for the lunch break. The Bartons have had more or less the same group of pickers coming every year for the last 30 years. Most of them live within a radius of 15 kilometers or so, and as the older pickers give up, youngsters automatically pick up the vacant places. A relaxing lunchtime is an important feature of the day. 
A reputation for good supplies of refreshing drinks, together with food of excellent quality and variety, has become an important element in recruiting the Barton's loyal army of pickers at Langwa. As well as the lunchtime repast, pickers are given a dinner to take home in the evening to sustain them after a tough day stooping in the vineyards, toting the heavy panniers or processing the picked grapes. When we, when we pick the grapes, we've um, got a somewhat different system now to what um, used to happen in the past. We're more conscious of the fact that the grapes should be brought whole into the, into the, um, the cellars where the process um, of um, crushing and so on, so on so what takes place. In the old days, I mean, not so many, many years ago, I mean, like um, up to 15 years ago, people still treaded the grapes outside. They stood in these um, big barrels and um, trod on the grapes and squashed them down. We then discovered this um, started the process of um, oxidization, which we reckon is wrong. So we now pick the grapes and um, we put them as carefully as possible into these um, well, trailers which we have behind the tractors. They're then brought into the, um, into the shea and they go through a machine which um, separates the grapes from the stalks. That again is a process which has been um, perfected in the last few years and there's less, less contact with the stalks because um, the stalks can obviously give a, a certain flavor to the wine and you may have heard people talking about it, a stalky wine. The grapes are then pumped more or less whole into the vats. The fermentation starts normally after a day or a day and a half. And here it lasts about four or five days. According to the year, it depends very much on the temperature. We still have wooden vats and sometimes they're criticized for being more difficult to control the temperature. But in fact, this is no longer so because um, we can be pumping the wine, which we do anyway, over the skins. And during this process, they go through a machine, which is a heat exchanger, and that brings the temperature down. So there's no, there's no um, problem about um, controlling temperature. They um, ferment, uh, as I say, four or five days, but they're left in contact with the skins quite a long time after the fermentation has come to an end because there's still a certain amount of extraction that takes place. They're drawing color and um, tannins and so on from, from, the, um, from the skins. And this is what um, makes a great wine, the decision how long to leave them in contact with the skins and how soon to draw them off. And this is where the, the art of making wine comes into its, um, into its strength. The second fermentation takes place mostly in new casks, and then it's the task of the proprietor and his close colleagues to assemble the wine. Racked from cask to cask and clarified using egg white, the wine is bottled during the second year following the harvest. Chateau Langua is at its best after 10 to 25 years. Leoville, a little longer, and Barton's second wine, Lady Langua, is for drinking young. But what qualities does Anthony suggest we should look for? When you're looking at a wine, the first thing is to look at the color. It's um, a 1985 Allais Ville Barton, so it's a wine that's only been in bottle for um, about two years now. It's um, beginning to get a nice color on it. Um, it's very bright, hardly thrown any deposit at this stage. Um, 1985 was a comparatively light year, so it's not very, very dark in color. The next thing in the tasting process is to swirl the uh, the wine round in the glass. This gets more wine to appreciate the nose, or bouquet, as we call it. Um, again, this is something that develops a lot after the wine has been in bottle. This being a young wine, it hasn't got quite the aromas as it will have later on. It's beginning to show a lovely fruity nose on it. Um, the next thing is to take a little sip. And we usually spit it out when we're tasting young wines, because sometimes we may have 20 or 30 wines we don't want to drink it all. These Medoc wines, when they're young, they're quite sharp to the palate, especially when you're tasting them like this without food. I think it's very important to remember that wines are basically made for um, consuming with food. And so the slight sharpness you would get at this stage in proceedings is perfectly natural. And um, 
I think this is going to develop into a lovely wine. One of the things I like very much about it is that it has what I call elegance or finesse. And I think it's going to turn out to be a, a lovely vintage. And no doubt, lovely it will be. Through careful husbandry, progressive research and development, and image building, the Barton vintages are held in high esteem. Anthony Barton has built on the enthusiasm, professionalism, and the commitment to quality re-established by his celebrated and fondly remembered Uncle Ronald. And the Irish connection with the Madoc's oldest family-owned estates will continue. Lillian Barton, Sartorius's children, Melanie and Damien, are Irish citizens. And the Irish links are recorded in family archives showing connections with Fermanagh, Tipperary, Donegal, Straffan, and Coot Hall in County Roscommon. Coot Hall and the other properties in Ireland were amassed by French Tom and his grandson, the successful Hugh, in 1845. He was able to value his French and Irish assets at more than 656,000 pounds. Coot Hall was worth a substantial 74,000, the French properties a modest 40,000, and Straffan 110,000. Little remains of the old Coot Hall, but Anthony Barton's birthplace, Straffan, will soon emerge as the Smurfit organization's Kildare Hotel and Country Club, no doubt stocking Barton and other fine growths from Bordeaux, and perhaps sampling the Bordelais cuisine in which Micheline Lawton specializes. The smell is terrible, it's terrific. It's lamprey, something that you may not know. Because lamprey, it's a very, very old fish, if you may say. It was known in the oldest days, at the time of the Romans, as far as that. It's a big eel. It's not exactly the same family as the eel. It can be very, very long, as long as that. It's very fat, much fatter than an eel. It can be as big as that, with a very ugly mouth. And it's a parasite. It sticks to other fish and goes up the river eating out the fish they have been sticking onto. Well, how is it cooked? Already at the time of the Romans, they were saying that lamprey should be made with Bordeaux red wines. So you have to bleed off this big eel, the lamprey. You keep the blood, of course, and you make a very good courbouillon with lots of good things, wine, red wine, and a strong red wine. And the best is the wine, the best is going to be the dish. And you add onions and lots of things, and carrots, and bones of fish, all kinds of things who are going to do a very good taste. And then you cook it as a sieve, as a sieve of a rabbit or something like that. And you may cook it for several days, it's even better. Three hours the first day, then the next day, two hours more, and the next day, one hour more. And it comes out like that. And you put a lot of leek in the sauce to cook it. And this is very special. You need the leek to have, with lamprey, a very good taste. And then, wine, as I told you, the best is the wine, the best is the dish. Today, we have a saint Estef. Félan Ségur, we say in French, and you say Félan. Of course, it's an Irish family. It's a very good saint Estef, one of the best. If you don't want to put as much money in your dish, you can use a less sophisticated wine, as Chateau Dillon, also an Irish name, and the dish is going to be very good too. You cannot eat it every day, but in Bordeaux, they love it. And I knew a very old man who used to say, Lampre, I believe in my life. I've been eating miles and miles of Lampre. Let's try if you come to Bordeaux. Lampre may not be your first choice, but the clarets with an Irish connection I can certainly vouch for. Most, like Barton's, bearing a label with the distinctive coat of arms of a wine geese family.
takes a big family, considerable wealth, and many generations to justify a mausoleum as imposing as this one in a Bordeaux cemetery. And I suppose a, an old, wealthy family is a handy epithet for the Johnstons. But to complete the definition, wine and Irish must be added. The Johnston dynasty was founded in Bordeaux in 1716, and across the years, this dynamic lineage has intermarried with the Irish back home, and not alone with other Irish wine geese families, but also with distinguished Bordelais wine families from the so-called aristocracy of the Cork. William Johnston arrived in Bordeaux from Ty Holland on the Armagh Monaghan border. His descendant, Dennis Johnston, starts the story. The Johnston came in Bordeaux uh, more than 250 years. It's uh, one of our ancestors, its uh, name is William, was in uh, Armagh or uh, London Derry. I think it's Armagh or Armagh, I don't know exactly. <laughs> and he was uh, going to uh, Amsterdam in order to learn about jewelry. And in fact, he passed through Bordeaux in order to go to Amsterdam. And when he went in Bordeaux, he tasted some wine and he loved the life. So he went to do this study in Amsterdam, and after he came back to Bordeaux. And he stayed uh, at least, uh, let's say, one year or two years to make a company with uh, some uh, other people. But as, a, as he had a ba very bad temper, well, things go wrong, and he was obliged to stop and to do his own business. So he, he made his own business, he started his own business, and uh, as if find that uh, the business was going well, he went, back to, he went back to Ireland in order to ask his wife and his children to come in Bordeaux with him it, and to live in Bordeaux. And uh, this is a little story, but uh, when they arrived just in front of the Garonne, an appelé, the boat sank, and he was obliged to arrive swimming. Well, if William did swim ashore, he could hardly have chosen a better landfall than the muddy banks of the Garonne in the Chartrand area outside the walls of Bordeaux, where so many other Irish were to set up as wine and general merchants. The Lawtons, the Bartons, O'Quinns, O'Burns, Galways and McCarthy's among them. The Johnsons continued to trade close to where they started in the 18th century. Nowadays, they're at 93 Bis Quai de Chartrand. That's the house behind 93, as the houses were built in pairs, dwellings to the front, the business and shea, the cellars to the rear. And the Johnsons have acres of cellars behind their present premises. But the mammoth size of their business during the early 1800s was such that they had cellars capable of holding six million bottles at Pessac outside Bordeaux. As Oog Lawton has pointed out, the immigrant families trading in the new claret made huge fortunes very rapidly enough for them to give loans to the wine growers and eventually to buy their own way into the Medoc to become shadow owners and wine producers themselves. Early on, the Johnsons had an interest in many chateaux, but the jewel in the family crown was Chateau de Cru Beau Caillou in Saint-Julien, still a fine second growth of the Medoc and a handsome residence with charming gardens. While not perhaps on the grand scale of de Cruz Beaucaillou, the little Johnson Chartreuse at Chateau Montbrison is not lacking in reputation and has twice been awarded the accolade as the best Cru bourgeois in the Medoc. There was a danger once that it would become a chicken farm until Jean-Luc van der Hayden and his mother, Betty, took it in hand. She's a member of that branch of the Johnsons which elected to remain as wine growers rather than merchants when the functions were divided between two brothers in 1870. The last grand dam of the family, while it was still best known for trading, was Betty's great-great-great-grandmother, Susanna Johnson, and it was a son of hers who bought to Cru Caillou as the family residence, and we have a chance to savour the legacy of his lifestyle. This is the place where I spent uh, five, six, seven years of my small um, childhood. My grandfather had a large family. My mother had seven brothers and sisters. The house sort of was too small, so my grandfather added two extra towers, which in fact have changed the whole aspect of the house. It was a normal chartreuse uh, before, a typical Medoc house. Now it's more imposing somehow. When I was a child, the house was covered with ivy. Of course, with the stone appearing, it makes a difference, but uh, 
it's, it, it has fine proportion just the same. When I was a child, I remember we had a little house of our own for having our guests, and we had a little kitchen of our own, and we could do our own cooking. And uh, in fact, we never were allowed in the main dining room. I remember coming downstairs on tiptoe and, and looking at all these fine people coming into supper with beautiful dresses and handsome gentlemen. And I was allowed to sit on the top stairs on the landing and watch them. One other thing I remember, which was, uh, is most unusual now, the shopping, the marketing was done once a month. And uh, there's a little harbor as you go down the way here. There's, a, there's Le Port de Bichevel. And uh, the, we, there was a big boat. And at the time, there were 17 servants in the house. So that meant a lot of food and a lot of upkeep. And uh, that, all the shopping was done once a month. And the boat would leave early in the morning and come back late at night. And with uh, well, the, an, what seems now to be an enormous lot of, of food. And, uh, uh, but, of course, I believe for that house it was necessary to... Uh, but never did... Um, n n the shopping was never done around here. All was done in Bordeaux. They were very wealthy. And uh, what is sad about this family is that somehow in the next 20 years after they were all living here, they all disappeared. One of my uncle, that was Edward Johnson, one night he was coming back on his yacht, which was moored down there, and just before mooring with Bocayou, he got hit by cargo going down. So that was one. And then um, Raoul Johnson was killed at just in the last days of the war. He was in the British Army. And my Aunt Daisy, um, she died in a sanatorium in Switzerland. She was uh, tuberculous. And Aunt Alice died on, uh, she was quite just a young married woman. And her first Christmas, uh, her dress caught on fire. She was uh, standing in front of the fireplace and she burnt. And uh, there was another one I forget Uncle Arthur, how, what happened to him. But I, in fact, I never knew any of these. Um, my mother was the youngest one of the seven. And she and my uncle George Johnson, but he died without any children either. So my mother had these three daughters and I'm one of them. But it's amazing how such a large family, with, and they had other estates around here in Medoc, and everything just collapsed in um, in about 20 years, 25 years. There are other Johnstons, but they come from another branch of the family. I think about five boys in, in town, in Bordeaux, all in the wine business. Three of the boys in Bordeaux, as Betty calls them, still trading under the 1772 business name, are Archibald, Nathaniel and Dennis. Nathaniel continues the family story. William and his son, Nathaniel. And William left Bordeaux in 1765, and Nathaniel had to take over all the company when he was only 21 years old. And this is the man who managed the company very well and received uh, Jefferson. And uh, at this time, they, they make with his friend Gettier and Jefferson, a type of classification of the different chateaux we have in this region. And this Nathaniel uh, will go on quite long. They are very worthy, and during the revolution, they were the introduction of the pepper money, and the uh, family was obliged to change a part of his gold against Alcina, and the uh, ancestor think this was very bad to have pepper, and with this paper, they bought a lot of land at this time. Finally, around 1860, the family had 25 chateaux. And at this time, they have an arrangement between the two branches of the family. And it was decided uh, that the youngest branch uh, will stay in the grower place, and the eldest branch will go in the wine shipping business. And this was making a gentleman agreement for by what I heard for 100 years. So we can restart to buy 
chateau in 18, 1970, but at this time, uh, because we have to suffer quite a lot from uh, the two different uh, wars uh, in 1914, and especially after, in between 1940 uh, 40 and 45, and we are unable to buy a chateau at this time. But the inability of this branch of the Johnsons to go back into chateau owning has not inhibited their core business as merchants. In a market dominated by international combines, the Johnsons are at the forefront of traditional family-run companies. As well as handling fine wines, Johnsons market a huge volume of generic red and white wines. When we drink Bordeaux, this is the kind that most of us drink most of the time, a bit up from the least expensive end of the wine list. Not plunk, you understand, but not chateau bottled either. Generics are blended from the wines of different chateaux to produce a style that appeals to specific markets with known requirements, as Nathaniel Johnson explains. We go to see, as I tell you, to see the, uh, the grower, and we ask them to produce the wine in a certain style. It is not exactly sometimes the style. This is what we have to correct sometimes some lot because they do not succeed exactly on the way we want. And this is why we receive 10 different chateaux, 12 different chateaux, and we have to, to mix the, the chateau in order to produce exactly the type of wine we want. This is our generic wine. So we are buying the X and a type of wine where we found exactly more or less what we like in it. And after our job is to adjust this wine all together in order to arrive to the type of the wine we design. So we can arrive with 12 different uh, chateaux and sometimes we use between these 12 chateaux only 10 or 11 on a certain quantity and the rest of the wine we keep it for the years next year in order to have another blending where we can correct what we still have with something else. What we will do today, we try to make a blend of this wine to match this sample we like very much. Uh, for that, we have prepared different samples and we have to test and to smell each differently to try to, to match this wine. So confronted with samples of a dozen different wines, each from a chateau producing something close to the desired style, and armed with his nose, his palate, a graduated cylinder and a spittoon, Archie begins by sampling the blend he's attempting to match. The bouquet of the wines on offer is tried in an orderly fashion, and a near match may call for a swill around the palate as well. With great deliberation, the favoured samples are drawn forward. These are the potential components for a test blend. So I put uh, one third of each, because there are three wines. The control sample is nearby for immediate comparison. And after we test compatibility to this wine, which is... And this one have a little more Sauvignon in it. And this one a little too much Sémillon. So this is a question of uh, tasting. We can try with uh, maybe 10% to see if it is sufficient and we will try after with my father and brother to, to adjust exactly the test which is uh, right compared to the other. So this is superb. I think the wine is really crisp, fruity. They have a touch of Sauvignon and Semillon. This is exactly in the same style of the wine we do actually. 
and this will be perfect to have a continuity on bottling on the wine we do today and which will be the same wine tomorrow, which is the Bordeaux we get ours. Skill and care are applied to the generics which pour out of the bottling plants. In the Madoc, that rare commodity, the fine classified wines, are bottled at the shadow of origin. This is a relatively new departure. Merchants always did the bottling in Bordeaux are at the point of sale. Indeed, we'll discover that merchants in Limerick and Dublin were among the most celebrated bottlers. Merchants may no longer bottle fine wines, but they continue to be sold through offices like Johnston's. Well, regarding the size of the company, it's uh, very difficult to speak about because it's changing all the time. You have to know that we have roughly between uh, uh, 1 million 500 bottles to 2 million bottles in our cellar uh, at different price. We are buying quite a lot of uh, main chateau. We are buying all the first crow. We are buying, well, a big part of the second crow, but not by one case. We are buying by 1,000 cases or 500 cases. And uh, so uh, we are, well, in a good place. It's very difficult to, to say because everybody is number one. And uh, uh, so the quantity of, uh, of cases we sell every year it's very difficult. We bought, what I, what I can tell you is we bought roughly between 50,000 to 100,000 cases of uh, wine bottle at the Chateau. So this is a part of our job. Uh, it depends on the vintage, it depends on the quantity, it depends on a lot of things. So it's changing from one time to the other time. And the bottling represents uh, something like 20% uh, of uh, our, uh, what we produce. All over Bordeaux, casks for generics await blending. And the fine wines are fussed over, binned and aging in bottle. That is, the red wines. The white wines of the locality don't need the same pampering, are sold young, and little of it will be found taking up space in cellars. With one exception, the fabulous white wines of the Sautain area south of Bordeaux. Here we can forget anything we learned about claret making. The Irish family connections also are different. A Maxwell at Giro and a McMahon at Chateau Wickham and Fio, where Comte Henri de Vaucelles reveals the mystery of Sauterne and establishes the family connection through Anne McMahon. She married Comte Henri de Lursalus just at the beginning of the uh, French Third Republic. And the French Third Republic began as a Republic of Dukes waiting the coming of the last representative of the Bourbon uh, dynasty. And uh, it was the highest point of traditional society in uh, France of the time, after the fall of Napoleon III. She was a niece of the first French president of the Third Republic, Maréchal de Macmahon. And so she was a part of the highest society of Paris and Europe. And church connections as well. In the chapel at Chateau Fio are personal messages from the Pope of the time to Anne McMahon. A connection of Anne McMahon and winemaking is Sauterne. Sauterne is a local uh, imitation, traditionally, of old holy wines of uh, Oriental churches in, uh, in Orient, in Mediterranean Orient. In such regions, they had an old tradition of drying the grapes to concentrate the juice and to produce by such conditions great sweet wines with long conservation possibilities. After centuries and centuries, Sauternes maintain this little part of tradition. You see uh, those grapes, very similar to Corin grapes, but the difference is the coming, because we are in more wet regions than in Greece, the coming of grey rot on some uh, grains. Lursalus family being more strongly connected with French uh, Catholic traditions, developed more strongly uh, the following of uh, traditionalist sweet wines. And so Sauternes being the center point of economical power of the family became the name of the type of such local wines. Chateau de Cam produces the best Sauternes, indeed one of the world's most prized wines. Anne McMahon was Comte Alexandre de Lourdes-Salus's grandmother. 
Marshall uh, McMahon was uh, probably the second generation after a, um, uh, the one coming from Ireland. He was uh, an officer uh, and uh, he had this, this fantastic uh, life of being a very successful officer. He became uh, Duc de Magenta, uh, the, the name which is still uh, the name of my uh, relative. And uh, he was afterward famous, uh, uh, becoming the first president of the Republic of France. There was an ambiguity. Uh, he, he was elected as a president because he was, in fact, uh, in favor of monarchy. Uh, and uh, thus uh, he, he was elected. And afterward, uh, I could say after him, uh, really start the real uh, Republic of France. My grandmother was uh, a MacMahon. Her name was Anne de MacMahon, and uh, she was a niece of uh, the Marshal. The Akam vines on the banks of the Misty Serone are picked over ten times in a six weeks harvest. Occasionally, the entire vintage may be rejected. What is so special? It's a white wine. It's a very sweet white wine. Uh, it's a, one of the most sophisticated. It's a wine which is very difficult to obtain. You must have the, the ground, which is a, a mystery. We have it uh, here at Ikem, and around uh, Ikem there is a, uh, at least uh, uh, there is 11 first growth and 12 second growth. So I can say we are in a family of great, uh, great soils. The, the secret is the way we harvest. I will show you. Here is one bunch, which, which I cut for the camera, but it's not ready to be picked, really. Uh, you can see there is many berries in different states. They are attacked by a small fungus, a small fungus which we call Botrytis cinerea, which is, in fact, known as the pourriture noble, the noble rot. Uh, it attacks the berries progressively, one by one. This uh, mysterious fungus has been discovered uh, probably during the 18th century, the, the people were observing that their wine was in this area of Sauterne. The wine was better when coming from these berries uh, concentrated by that fungus. We suffered a, a big hailstorm in July, and all these are dead berries. They are not good, and uh, anyhow, they have to be cleaned by the pickers. So they do two jobs at once. They clean the bunch for the future and they also pick up individually the berries which have reached the right level of concentration. The big problem is that uh, you lose a great deal of the volume. Uh, one vine gives here just one glass per year instead of a normal bottle elsewhere. But this is the duty to pay uh, to, to get that concentration and that liquor, this sweetness of the wine. One glass per vine at a cam, at least a bottle per vine for other styles, from the sublime to the voluminous, perhaps. But the Bordeaux market is layered to satisfy a range of demands. And quality is a genuine concern at all levels, as we saw in Chateau Langlois and with the blending of a Johnson generic wine. The Sheelers are merchants who also own Chateau Kerwin, which we will visit on our next trip up the Madoc. Remarkably, it was never owned by the Johnsons. But now to the serious business of finding a dish for one of our newfound wines. Micheline Lawton suggests foie gras. You have foie gras in different places of France, mostly in Alsace and in Gascony. But it's cooked in a very different way. In Alsace, it's marinated and put in a, cooked in a terrain with lots of uh, things who add a certain flavor. In Gascony, it's just plain just cooked with nothing, maybe a little bit of armagnac, quite a lot of salt and pepper, because it needs to have quite a lot of things to, to elaborate a little bit the flavor. Generally, we have it just cooked in a terrine, and we eat it cold, as you have it here. That's a terrine of duck foie gras. But you may have it hot as well, and it's the most delicious thing you may have in the world. But then you have to buy, of course, a raw lever, a big raw lever, and you cut it in slices, rather thin, as it is there, 
and then you just cook it one side the other so that it has a nice color but it's not overdone inside then you may have different sauce to add you may add green pepper and a little bit of porto you can add apples also with a little bit of porto it's absolutely delicious in the pan just after it's being made a few minutes and of course the most traditional in bordeaux is to have it with sauterne because foie gras in the beginning of the century was generally given after the main course and then with a red wine burgundy or a very strong bordeaux pomerol or saint emilion but now more and more people like to have foie gras at the beginning at the start of the meal and then with sauterne it's chilled Sauterne, not cold, but really chilled. Here, we have the king of the Sauternes, with Chateau d'Iquem, as you may know. But there are many others, very good too, a little less expensive maybe. For instance, Chateau Fillot, who was originally owned by an Irish family. In French, we would say Le Maréchal MacMahon. I believe you say MacMahon. It's difficult to, for us to say this name. Anyway, it has links with Ireland. So this is very good too, but you can use also for the cooking plain sauterne appellation wine. And you try to make a sauce with a chicken or with a rabbit, with basically sauterne, and I tell you, it's really delicious. Kilkenny Castle, a medieval pile with restoration chateau pretensions. This is the seat of the Butlers, that Norman family of Walters which became senior toastmasters or chief butlers of Ireland in 1185, hence the name. Betokening the privilege of senior toastmaster, wine and vine motifs are everywhere to be found. By tradition, the butlers proffered the first cup of wine to each new monarch. Depicted on the fine Carrara fireplace in the Great Hall, this act conferred butlerage on the family, by which they received a levy on all wines imported into these islands for 726 years. This right was relinquished to the crown in 1811, just about the time when Irish wine importers were improving their businesses. The Fineta wine business was established uh, here in Dublin in 1823 and grew to become one of the most significant wine empires in the British Isles. The company in Ireland was one of the largest both in food and wine and at one stage had 21 shops throughout the entire nation. We used to buy from Bordeaux um, from the um, well-known negotiants, most of whom had the Irish connection but I don't think that was the particularly the, the importance of buying from them. We bought from them because they came over here, they saw us. In those days we shipped in in cask, 
quite often an order could be 50 casts, 50 hogsheads of Laerville Barton. And we were very proud of our bottling. We reckoned we could bottle much, much better than perhaps the producer, that we would bottle when the climatic condition was right. We'd find the white wines with the whites of egg and the red wine with the ox blood direct hot from the abattoir. No doubt this added some extra flavors and dimensions lacking from the um, clarets of the moment. The clarets of this moment don't seem to need the alchemy of blood. And there's a wine goose in Bordeaux, a wine gosling, I suppose, who produces Domaine du Closseau from the half acre behind his weekend country house. It's possible to keep a thousand vines producing about the same number of bottles of wine before the French excise men become interested. Professor Michael Scott, who has lived in Bordeaux for 14 years, tends the 960 vines at his weekend retreat. Light tasks like pruning Michael does himself. For heavier jobs, the neighbors are roped in and there's a kind of metal to cope with the sultry September harvest. There's great warmth about Ireland in Bordeaux. That's one of the surprising, um, even very moving facts about living here. I met the mayor on one occasion. He used to be prime minister, Mr. Chabon Delmas. He's a very remarkable man. And when the person who introduced me said I was Irish, he threw up his arms like General de Gaulle and said, uh, vive l'Irlande. It was an unusual reaction. I'm not sure every country in the world, I doubt, it would get uh, such a friendly reaction. For the first time, I found being an Irishman abroad, I was rather a special, regarded as rather a special animal, and in a very nice way. And um, my perception of things, I must say, changed slightly. I found I was, as part of an Irish community, including some, some very recent Irishmen, but not very many. I think there are about 50 of us, really, from not more in the border region but directly from Ireland, uh, but then of this much wider community with all of these old, Ir old Irish families uh, with a tremendous interest in Ireland, a tremendous respect for Ireland and for the great Irish traditions. And uh, as you know, terrible things happened in Ireland in the 17th century. I wouldn't bore everyone with what, what, with, with what went on, but it meant v mainly land changing hands, not, not to, to put too fine a point on it. <laughs> And those whose hands it was taken out of, actually, they, they mainly came down here and they uh, maintained a lot of the, I'd say, the old aristocratic view of the, of the Irish race. And none more aristocratic than the Lynch family, sometime merchants and proprietors of the celebrated Chateau Lynch badge, as well as Lynch Moussas, Chateau Dozac and Chateau Pontac Lynch. The proprietor of Lynch badge now is Jean-Michel Caz, who's determined to maintain links with the Lynch homeland. John Lynch came to Bordeaux in 1691, I think, just after the Battle of Le Boyne. And he settled there and uh, finally married uh, a French girl. His son, John Lynch's son, became involved in the, in the wine trade by marrying the daughter of the wine uh, grower, uh, who was Jacques Drouillard uh, in the early 1700s and uh, she was the daughter of the, the owner of the Badge estate, where we are now. So uh, Thomas Lynch, that was his name, uh, became a, a wine producer, and they, they actually had several estates. And when his uh, father-in-law died, and it was around 1749, he became the, the owner of this place, of uh, the estate of Badge, and uh, his son after him. Jean-Baptiste was Thomas' son, eldest son, and he was also a prominent figure in character in, in Bordeaux. He was the mayor of Bordeaux for during the reign of Napoleon I, uh, whom he betrayed <laughs> in uh, 1815 uh, after Waterloo. They were two brothers, uh, Jean-Baptiste and Michael. When Thomas died, Michael took care of this property. He probably lived at Musas, which is another property of his, uh, about two miles from here. But he was extremely uh, well known in Poyac by the end of the 18th century. And eventually he was in uh, 1797 
elected the mayor of the of the city here. So there is a tradition of uh, uh, mayorship in in the Lynch family in Galway and Poyak and Bordeaux. I have uh, good contact with Galway, so I went there to look for the the family, the, the real, the actual Lynch family, the, the part that, that remain in, in Galway. So for a few days, we looked around and finally arrived in, in a little place called Partry, where there was a Mrs. Louis Blossy Lynch who still lived there. It was very uh, moving, extremely interesting to meet with this, this person. Mrs. Blossy Lynch uh, spoke excellent French. We had a cup of tea. We talked about her family. She knew about her ancestors going to France, and uh, she said, I know they had a vineyard there, and she still has uh, records and uh, documents on her part of the family. Like the chateau, Patry House may pass out of Lynch ownership as well. But in the Medoc, sentimental recollection of the Lynch connection is retained. We are at Chateau Grandis at uh, saint saint cadour We produce some wine. And this house is in our family since uh, many, many centuries. And my uh, great, great, great grandmother, Mary Alice Lynch, lived here. And we still have some things belonging to her. A touching collection of bric-a-brac and an interest in genealogy give some substance to disappearing wine geese families and Irish names, but some have gone, diluted to extinction by intermarriage with the French and subsumed into the dominant French culture. But the wine geese are far from being culturally henpecked. Cyclamens are the harbingers of the wine harvest seen in profusion at the Burke Chateau Siran. The proprietor is Alain Burke Miai, expert on Burke and Lynch family histories. Among the uh, wild geese who had turned wine geese, as you would say, uh, Lynch certainly is the most famous uh, because of the... Well, the, the owners of uh, Poyac have done extremely well. Uh, I, I would say that uh, Bage uh, is certainly the leader among the four growths uh, that belong to the Lynch family. In fact, uh, John uh, J.B. Lynch had um, Dozac and Pontac here. Uh, of course, Dozac is very good Margot, but uh, in the last few years, you have to give the credit that Bage uh, became the most prestigious. The Burke Chateau has its own prestige. It's a welcoming Chartreuse with a well-managed estate producing a cru bourgeois superior of great character. A Norman Irish family, the Burks came back to France, to Bordeaux, via the Philippines. John Burke um, came to Manila uh, around 1855 and uh, married um, an Anglo-Spanish girl uh, whose name was um, uh, Maria Carlotta Butler. Um, and they had three boys and a girl. And the girl was my grandmother, uh, Mary Burke, who married a Frenchman, Fernand Desparat. My husband's grandfather was a wine merchant in Bordeaux, and he used to visit uh, the mansions in England and in Ireland to help them to, to, to sell wine and to have nice and good sellers. And he went to visit the Burke family in Ireland, and then he met the daughter he found charming and eloped with her, that was a big scandal in the family because she was, she was engaged to some uh, British lord and that, that, that's how it happened. Uh, then the, they settled in Bordeaux. They had a daughter who was my mother-in-law, my husband's mother, and they bought Du Cru Bocaillou, which they sold in 19, during the last war because they, they, they couldn't maintain it uh, as well as they used to, because they had eight, at that time they had 18 gardeners. And my mother-in-law, their daughter, married uh, Edouard Miai, who had several uh, properties in Médoc, uh, Pichon, Longueville, Lalande, Siran, which is the family property bought in uh, 1858 uh, from the Toulouse-Lautrec family, and which we still have and where we are now today. We're at the beginning of the Margot district. 
We have about 35 hectares of uh, vines producing 150,000 bottles a year. And um, we've been supplying the uh, presidency of the Euro Parliament for a great many years and, uh, and well, on many good restaurant tables you find on, on the nice wine list. Also from Galway, the Kirwins hailed from Craig Castle, now a centre for traditional music. This is Domain de la Salle in Margot. An English merchant, Sir John Collingwood, enlarged and improved this ancient estate, and in 1750, Mark Kirwin of the Bordeaux Winegeese family married into the property. It's now owned by the proprietor of the merchant house, Schroeder and Scheeler, Jean-Henri Scheeler. The first thing Kirwin did when his wife became the owner of the property, he changed the name to Kirwin. Uh, lots of chateaus were named after the family who owned them. And Kerwin got very fascinated by the chateau. And he really made a, a real work. The expansion continued until the disaster comes with, with the French Revolution. So with the French Revolution, things are very unclear. There was a fortress in Bordeaux called Fort du Ar. The three brothers Kerwins, although they were put in prison, were giving in that fortress big party for the high society in Bordeaux. They were receiving guests in their prison. So I don't think that they have been treated very badly uh, when they were in prison. So rumors of Mark Kirwan's demise were greatly exaggerated. But Dr. Guillotine's deadly machine did decimate the influential Dillon family. The Dillon name is part of the history of France. First from 1689 to 1789, in 1689, the Dillon came with all their people in front of the King of France, having left Ireland, and they became one of the four Irish regiments which were part of the King's personal guard. In 1789, the Dillon stayed in the various regiments of armies of the French Republic. Arthur Dillon has his name inscribed on the Ark of Triumph. Here we are at Chateau Dillon. That's Robert Dillon's property. He bought it in 1753. Robert Dillon was an Irishman who settled in France with his wife for business reasons, because he had to take over the family business, which was in Bordeaux. He lived there for 11 years and had 13 children and where he died in 1773. He was leaving the dinner table and suddenly he looked at his wife and he said, oh, my poor wife, oh, my poor children, and he dropped dead. Now you see the state in which this property is. I think that all the Dillons of the world should unite to rebuild this place as it should be. Another Dillon Chateau, Chateau de Bouy, is a magnificent colossus, only a fraction of which was completed because Lucy Dillon's husband was beheaded during the revolution. In today's Bordeaux, we find more wine geese, influential but without a named chateau. A member of the rum-producing family, Maureen Bardenay, was born Maxwell. My great-grandfather, James Maxwell. He was born in 1810 and he studied in Trinity College. He lived in Dublin. But then at the time, he, I think he studied law, but he was not able to uh, become a solicitor, what he would have liked to do because of the law then. Being a Catholic, he could not do anything. And uh, he sailed off to the West Indies, Saint Pierre, Martinique. And he married uh, a French woman named Agélie Mougenot. He remained in Martinique. He was a, a powerful man. His firm was very well known, very important in Saint Pierre. And he had two sons born there. And then he decided after some years to leave Martinique and go back to Europe. 
So they decided on Bordeaux. My great-grandfather wanted his sons to remain Irish, and one of them kept the Irish nationality, much to please his father, the one who remained Irish, inherited by his wife, Chateau Giraud in Sauternes. And uh, he was very well known in Sauternes because he managed Chateau Giraud. My grandfather, Sam Maxwell, married Mathilde Sinto, whose father owned Paclemo in uh, Chateau de Grave. And uh, when his father-in-law died, uh, he became the manager of Pape Clément because his wife had inherited. And unfortunately, uh, Pape Clément was sold in 1944. But my own father was married in Pape Clément. Ships easing past the Madoc are involved in the wider Bordelais business, transacting under the patronage of the Chamber of Commerce. Unlike its Irish counterparts, this chamber is resourced to act as a development corporation. Its director of development is David Maxwell. The Irish have um, taught uh, the, uh, the, the border people to uh, nurse the, their wine, because you see, uh, Lots of, most wines do not travel well. Bordeaux uh, wines travel well, and that we owe we owe uh, that fact to the um, British and mainly to the Irish because at at these times ships from Cork uh, came loaded with uh, food products. Cork was the most important harbour for importing Bordeaux wines, well before Scotland and then Bristol. Bristol was the third. While the primacy of Cork as a wine port has collapsed, Bordeaux has made itself the wine capital of the world. The capital for wine finance, for wine tourism, for wine education, and wine marketing through Vinexpo. Vinexpo, when, you, when we talked about it here in, in, in Bordeaux, and, and to, uh, business, to, to wine business people, they thought we were mad. Uh, uh, to th just to think of bringing buyers from all over the world to producers from all, all over the world here in Bordeaux, that, that was un unthinkable then, but we stuck to it and we've, we had now the uh, most important, the only one I should, uh, should think on a, on a business uh, point and th that bet of, of putting up an, a meeting every two years in June of everything that counts in, in, the, in the wine and spirits uh, business. The heart of Bordeaux's own business interest is its clarets. There's a kind of form book for the top wines of Madoc, the Growths or Crews. Premier Grand Cru Classé signifies the best, Dersium second, and so on for five categories. This classification has held good for nearly 150 years. There was a famous exhibition in Paris. 1855, Napoleon III, it was a, the great time of Napoleon III, and so on. And for that exhibition, it seems that it would be interesting uh, to uh, show the best clarets made in Bordeaux. So uh, the Chamber of Commerce in Bordeaux, the brokers in Bordeaux, not the proprietors, they were asked uh, to try to make a classification of the best wines in Bordeaux. And at that time, uh, what did they do? They, was, they were under no pressure at all. They looked into their figures, prices of the wine sold in the last 20 years, the location of each chateau, whether the, the, the building itself, the reputation of the wine, prices, price and quality, they go together. And finally, they said, we need about 60, because there are really 60 or 62 or 63 chateaus which deserves a classification, and then they decided to put in five classes without any pressure, without any fighting. It was done uh, very, very simply. Uh, just that this it happened that this classification has been made so intelligently that it has held the good for, under, for over 125 years. As a merchant, I say this classification is fair, and if we had to do it again, I'm not sure that it would be that fair. 
Only Chateau Moutard Ross Shield has been reclassified since, and a bottle will set you back over £70. How can we sample the wine geese chateau without being crucified by market forces? Of course, uh, one of the reasons, apart from market forces uh, that have made the ground crew uh, so expensive, is their new system of uh, sort of declassifying uh, a lot of the lesser wines so that only the best casts go into the final assemblage of the Grand Cru. And this can often mean that up to 30% of a particular vintage would be declassified. Perfectly good wine, but not, in their opinion, great enough uh, to carry the first label. And this has allowed uh, all these great chateaux to bring out a second label or a second wine, which is often a mere fraction of the price. Uh, it will tend to be lighter, less concentrated, and also faster maturing than the uh, Cru Classé. But in every respect, wines of character which exactly reflect the soil and the aspirations of the winemaker. Uh, for instance, you've got uh, Chateau Félan Ségur, a lovely growth and now going through uh, a rebirth uh, in saint Estef. And they, this is it, in fact, here, Chateau Félan Ségur. They now bring out a second wine, and they call it Frank Phelan. You couldn't get more Irish than that. You can go to Leoville and Langua Barton. Barton's straightforward Langua is outstanding. So certainly one should look out for Barton's uh, lovely St. Julian wine. Uh, down at uh, Lynch uh, Bage, Jean-Michel Caz, one of the most charming of men and one of the great innovators. I think, in fact, he had a great influence on Anthony Barton. Uh, he does not alone a second wine, which he calls Chateau Haut Bage Avarus. He also does a, a red and white generic Bordeaux, uh, which he calls Michel Lynch. These are wines, I think, of the future, which mere mortals like myself can afford to indulge in and enjoy the true taste of uh, Bordeaux at uh, a price that, is, uh, that makes sense. So us mere mortals can savour wines immortalising some of the great wine geese names. If we exclude the many Irish merchant families that died out, this programme has found 17 prominent Irish names associated with 43 Chateau, 35 of these in the Madoc. The Lawtons were involved in Chateau Pavé de Luz, Leoville Poiferry, De Pez, Bataille, and Cantonac Brown. The Phelan family had Felin Seguer and a Bataille connection. The Boyds owned Boyd Cantonac, and Peter Mitchell from Swords, who revolutionized glassmaking in Bordeaux, had Chateau du Tertre. The O'Burns from Cabantili owned the Austere La Orang, while Barton's at one time or another had an interest in Margot and Latour. And of course owned Le Bosque, Langua and Leoville. Following custom, the Barretts from Cork gave their name to their chateau, while Johnsons have connections with Lascombe and Latour, Malacott, Mombrizon, Dozac, Margot, and the beautiful De Cru Beau Caillou. Burke eyes have links with Syrah, Dozac, and Pichon Longville, Comtesse de Lalande. In 1753, this became Robert Dillon's chateau, and Lucy Dillon had De Bouis, the unfinished one. The Maxwells married into Pap Clement and Chateau Giro in Sauterne. The residence at Chateau Clark has gone. This family came from County Down. Chateau de Cam, Coutet and Fio are connected with the McMahon family. Looking like a small muckrous house on the Madoc, Lashnay was built by the Eckshaws from Dublin. This was owned by the Kirwins from Galway until 1827, and the Lynches also from Galway had Dosac, Lynch Bage, Lynch Moussas, and Pontac Lynch. Finally, Chateau McCarthy, once owned by descendants of the clan Dermot McCarthy's with their origins in Kilcoe Castle on Roaring Water Bay in West Cork, the last outpost to surrender after the Battle of Kinsale. Under the shadow of Kilcoe, a tenuous French connection is being perpetuated by the farming of mussels 
the delectable and delicious moule destined for the markets of France. Tropical butterflies, but not the tropics. These are chateau-dwelling creatures. The peacocks, the caligos, the papilios, the swallowtails and bird wings make their home in a castle fortress of great antiquity, built on Roman remains sometime during the 11th century to secure the border between France and Brittany. The papilios and monarchs reign in Chateau de Goulaine, where butterfly farming is one of the commercial endeavours created to raise the annual £110,000 necessary for the maintenance of the magnificent pile. Each year, thousands of visitors, young and old and from far afield, throng to see the chateau. Among the sideshows are a visit to the butterflies and a chance to meet Robert, 11th Marquis de Goulaine, butterfly enthusiast, celebrated winemaker and dynamic owner of the chateau. It's in the Loire Valley, southeast of Nantes, which, like Bordeaux, was a favourite port of entry for the Irish in the 17th and 18th centuries. Chateau Goulaine was modified in the 15th century to conform to the fashionable Loire look. Being close to Nantes, the Goulains have gathered a network of Irish family connections down the generations. This, and being descended from Brian Boru and Mary, Queen of Scots, gives rise to an interest in genealogy, the Marquis' passion. You start from a point in the middle, which is yourself, and around you have a half a circle your mother, half a circle your father, and every new circle is a new generation. Just what I've done there, that's about 11 generations. And already I find a lot of my Irish ancestors. You know, we, on my father's side, we are uh, related to the Galway family. On my mother's side, we related to the O'Brien and to the O'Shaughnessy through the De La Main, to the Coppingy, to the Kavanagh, to the Mead. But to come back to the Goulain, we definitely are the oldest wine growing family in the world. We've always been there, and so you see my name is Robert de Goulain. Uh, the chateau is Chateau de Goulain uh, in the village of High Goulain, and even the area code, that's just a bit too much, is Low Goulain. So it's all Goulain, Goulain, Goulain. The river is called the Goulain, the marshes are the marshes of Goulain, and of course the vineyards are the vineyards of Goulain. Uh, on my father's side, we've uh, never moved from this area. We've always been there, uh, in the same place. In the genealogical tree in the, the great drawing room upstairs, coming back from, uh, well, the first known ancestor. You can, after that, trace from father to son. And then going right up to yourself. That way, as far as we are concerned, means 30 generations. The first one was John, captain of the city of North. 
Then his son, he was called Matthew, and he acted as a private ambassador between the King of England and the King of France in order to try and reestablish the peace between the two kings. This must have been one of the most delicate tasks in the history of diplomacy. Three times Matthew established some kind of peace between France and England, and for this diplomatic triumph, the family was awarded both coats of arms, the leopards of England and the fleur-de-lis, the lilies of France, a unique honor. The towers at Chateau Goulain are reminders of valor and skill. The tower on the right commemorates Matthew's success as a peacemaker with the coat of arms and also the motto that went with it. À cette huile-ci, à cette huile-là, j'accorde les couronnes, which means that the first words are A's. À cette huile-ci, the first A, à cette huile-là, the second A, j'accorde, the third A, and the crowns. And in fact, it means between this king and that king, I reestablish the peace. And this was symbolized by three A's in the type, in the shape of a triangle, and above the left A and above the right A, you can still see what was the crown of England and the crown of France, which are a bit different. Another tower commemorates Yolande. Her father was away on a crusade and she was left in charge with a small garrison. It was a siege, but the soldiers were too cowardly to fight. Commemorated in the weathered carving, Yolande threatened to put a dagger through her heart rather than surrender the chateau. This threat shamed and spurred the soldiers into action and the day was saved. The family's great time was the 17th century. That was the time where the estate was the largest. It covered over 100,000 acres. And uh, from there, everything went without many major problems up to the revolution time. And at that time, there were three Goulain, three boys, who were in their 30s, and two were shot, and the last one died on the royalist side, outside France. And that one had left two little children who, just when the revolution started, were two and four, a boy and a girl. And you can imagine what could be the life at that time. They had to hide in the woods, and in fact, they were saved by a wonderful old gamekeeper who hid them and used to take them on a, on a donkey and hide them in, on baskets on each side of the donkey and give them some cherries not to talk when they were in the woods and the Republicans uh, arrived too close. Um, that little boy, 20 years later, married Henrietta Galway, the Galway family from Cork and Waterford, and uh, that family was, um, many of the members were mayors of Cork uh, during centuries. And then if we go forwards, uh, we come to my mother's grandmother, uh, born Harcourt, um, was herself a descendant of the O'Brien family. So you see that's one or the other Irish connections. Uh, the famous O'Brien of Clare, the Viscount Clare, Marshal of France, who came to France with the wild geese in the middle of the 18th century. Charles O'Brien was the fifth Viscount Clare. After the surrender of Limerick in 1691, he left for France with the rank of captain in James II's personal guard. In 1757, his son, the sixth Viscount Clare, was created a Marshal of France in recognition of his outstanding military abilities. I am the O'Brien of Thomond, the chieftain of the O'Brien clan. I'm a direct descendant of Brian Boru, the High King of Ireland, who was killed at Clontarf in 1014. The O'Briens have been in Ireland, uh, very much part of Irish history from that time, uh, right the way up through the kings of Munster, up until the earls of Thomond occupied this castle here, Bunratty Castle, behind me. Actually, the fifth and the sixth Viscount left Ireland with the wild geese to fight in France and where they distinguished themselves and they never came back and the Viscounts Clare, that side of the O'Brien family, have remained in France ever since and it's through that side of the family that I'm related to the Marquis de Gala uh, and our association still remains with France. We still have a lot of 
O'Briens in France uh, who never came back to Ireland. The waves of emigration which brought the Irish to Bordeaux had a similar result in Nantes, but many more came to this port which was 200 miles closer to Ireland. The immigrants here were more representative of Irish society and not predominantly the merchant classes. In fact, captains who brought emigrants at a profit of a crown a head were told that too many destitute Irish were putting pressure on the city's resources. So numerous were the Irish that in 1694 the Bishop of Nantes donated the Manoir de la Touche as an Irish college. This lasted for almost a century before the seminarians and priests were deported. The building has since disappeared, but the nearby parish church of saint Similian was one of the churches favoured by the Irish community. The parish records at saint Similian read like a who's who of the Nantes Irish elite of the 18th century. Shields, Stapletons, Reedies, Reardons, Walshers, Clarks, Barrys, O'Keefe's, O'Sullivan's and many more. This tiny Madonna found in the woods was an object of particular veneration by the Irish who were baptised, married and buried at San Similian. And commemorated here too were three Irish bishops named O'Keefe, Patrick Comerford and Robert Barry, along with many of the powerful 18th century Irish elite created by marriages between the Walshers, Shields and Clarks and their intermarriage with local nobility. While the Irish College gave spiritual succour to the community, the commercial sustenance of the wealthy came from a general import-export trade quite like that of Bordeaux. The traditional trade with Ireland was fairly small time by comparison with the trade in sugarcane and tobacco, but the real fame and wealth of Nantes came from a three-way trade in ebony, a shameful euphemism for slaves. And the Irish were not above reaping the benefits from packing hundreds of slaves below decks in Guinea, selling them in the Antilles, and taking sugarcane aboard for France. Such a voyage brought a 200% return for the merchant and contributed to the thriving sugar refiners and shipbuilders. The amateur, the ship owners of Nantes, maintained a fleet of 2,500 ships right into the 19th century. This smug prosperity in Nantes was disrupted by Carrier, the local administrator, during the Reign of Terror. Of all the atrocities carried out nationwide, the dreaded noyads, the drownings by Carrier, were the worst. He dispatched royalists, clerics, and even some Irish by taking them out into the tideway in barges, which were then scuttled. Carrier was arraigned and executed in 1794. But by this time, Nantes was beyond the zenith of its commercial power. Earlier, the Irish families of McNamara, Shield, Galway, Walsh, Clark and McCarthy had amassed fabulous wealth. Like the Bordelais Irish, the Nantes settled themselves in fine riverside houses along the Quai de la Fosse, on the Ile de Fado, and in elegant squares like the Cour Cambron, where the Galways had property much of it still in excellent repair today. Among the Irish families from the Quai de la Fosse, the Clarks probably have left the most indelible tracks in the modern city of Nantes. The most celebrated Clark was Henry, son of Colonel Thomas Clark of Dillon's Irish Brigade. A confidant of Wolfe Tone, Henry served as war minister on three occasions and Napoleon created him Duc de Felt in 1809. He died in 1818. The Clark de Felt collection was given by a legacy to Nantes after the death of the two sons of the Maréchal, Claude de Felt. She, she is the daughter of the Maréchal, so the sister of the two brothers. When they died in 18... 52. They um, give their collection to the Louvre, but the Louvre didn't want it. So uh, Nantes was choose because there were uh, here a big museum with a big collection of ancient paintings, and the legacy was um, with a lot of conditions. So uh, the collection had to be put in only one piece of the museum with special furnitures, with special velvet, with the name of the donator, 
and the town has to pay for the two portraits of the brother, Edgar and Alphonse de Feltre, and they had to give each year a concert for the poor and playing the music of Alphonse de Feltre, who was a musician, and the collection had to be always in the same room. So for a long time, these conditions were respected. While all of the Clark wishes may not have been respected in perpetuity, the Duc de Felt does have a fashionable shopping street named after him. On the Rue de Felt, St. Nicholas Church was also favored by the Irish community in the same way as the Church of St. Similian. A Toby Clark from Nantes acquired Domaine de Grange in the Medoc in 1771. Later, his son, Luke Toby, renamed the property Chateau Clark. Recently, the vineyards have been refurbished with great care by Baron Edmund de Rothschild, so the Clark name is being perpetuated in that way. While the actual shadow is gone, the one belonging to their relation, the Marquis de Goulain, is proving to be more durable. The foundations of the chateau are quite old. We even think that there were some Roman foundations, Gallo-Roman foundations. I would say that initially it was around 1100. It was, of course, a fortified castle protecting Brittany against France, uh, the two countries being different at the time. And when Brittany became part of France, there was no reason to keep the fortified castle. So the Goulain of the time demolished most of the ramparts and towers and fortifications. And built by 1480, 1485, he built most of it as a new chateau in the style of the Loire Valley and this was exactly 500 years ago. And then his great-grandson added two wings, the big ballroom and the chapel. Ballroom is on the left and the chapel is on the right. And these two wings were added by 1620. And then very fortunately they stopped building because uh, up to now I have about two acres and a half roof. So you can imagine it's a big problem to maintain this. The family spent too much money in the court during the 18th century and had to sell the chateau by 1788, you see, one year before the terrible French Revolution. And the chateau was bought by a Dutchman, but the Dutchman was specifically a banker. And being a banker, having a lot of money, being careful enough not to be either on one side or the other side with the Republican or the Royalist, he was left quite alone by himself in the chateau and no one worried to bother him. So this is how it escaped during the French Revolution. During the Hundred Days, Napoleon was a bit anxious that the local people would start fighting for royalism again uh, because they were very royalist. So he sent a regiment uh, with a general called Amarque who took his headquarters in Goulain. And one rather sad evening, probably after drinking too much of the delicious uh, Goulain Muscadet, uh, all of a sudden the, the, the troop decided that the chateau should be burned because, you see, all the others had been burned. And it was the only one which had escaped. So I must say Lamarck, in fact, saved the chateau because he persuaded the people, the soldiers, not to burn the chateau. But he had to give something in a, a sort of compensation. And opposite the chateau in the, that courtyard, there's that very old tower, which is called the Archive Tower. So he said to them, well, you can burn the archives. So the soldiers m went into the tower, took off all the archives and burned them. Now, fortunately, most of the archives didn't really burn because, you know, that sort of uh, parchment doesn't burn easily. So many of them were saved, but not all. Many disappeared during the last war. The German came uh, in 1940 and also decided that they'd have their headquarters here. But the geographical situation of Goulain is very special. We are on flat land, but it's very well protected because, you see, there's that very long avenue, which is about a mile long, and on both sides of the avenue, uh, you've got water, canals, marshes, which come round the chateau almost to each side of the avenue. So my uncle uh, said, yes, uh, you've got the victory for the present time, so do what you want. But um, you could be trapped by partisans. And uh, the Germans were very afraid, and they turned away and disappeared. And we never had them any further after. 
In the turbulent history of the chateau, the revolution could have wiped out the line. The chateau would not have survived had it not been in the hands of an impartial Dutchman. After half a century, it was Patrice de Goulain, a son of the boy in the donkey's pannier, and Henrietta Galway who bought back the property. The present Marquis got it from the younger branch. When I bought it back from an uncle of mine in 1957, it was in a very fearful state. Most had to be done in terms of the roofing, the furniture had disappeared, the gardens had been, the formal gardens had become just a meadow, the moat was empty, the walls of the ramparts had fallen down, and so in the last uh, uh, 30 years I've been doing a huge job restoring all that, and it's taken most of my energy and I would also say uh, of my purse. I knew through old engravings what sort of furniture there was, and it was a sort of treasure hunting through the whole of Europe to find back the pictures, bring them back where they were, and probably the most uh, extraordinary achievement was the furniture, the set of armchairs, which is very unique. It's uh, a set of armchairs which were carved by a very famous uh, sculptor called uh, Sene, and the tapestry is from the manufacture of Beauvais, showing the fables of La Fontaine. And this had been sold by my great-grand-uncle in 1890. And so it took me 20 years of my life to find back the furniture, which I finally found uh, in Switzerland, belonging to an Italian. The Italian was very rich, he didn't want money. So I had to exchange this um, furniture against uh, other furniture which interested me interested him so that um, we I had to find the furniture I had to make an agreement with him and finally a truck took down the furniture he had chosen from Paris to Lyon another truck went up from Gen Geneva to Lyon and there we were ma made the exchange almost like checkpoint Charlie and exchanging the spies so hopefully it will never move again and now we're moving from the lovely blue drawing room upstairs uh, to the vaulted cellar of the chateau which is the only vaulted cellar in the whole vineyard of Nort and this is where the rock meets the foundations of the chateau compared to the complex claret making Muscadet is straightforward and develops its character in a different way for a start only one grape type is used and vinification is simpler um, we do not rack the wine uh, we like to keep it on the lees. Uh, the lees may seem a funny word, it means the sediments. And uh, we keep the wine on the lees until the time of the bottling, so that ensures uh, further freshness and uh, maybe more body, more, more charm to the wine. Like most of the wines of the Loire Valley, we, we think that uh, the dry white wines uh, should be kept not for that long time. Of course, we're not talking of wines we're going to keep for, um, you know, 10 or 20 years, like the great uh, Bordeaux. Uh, but we like to keep them for about two, three years. And we have an old saying in the area, which is two months, two years, which in fact means don't drink the wine earlier than two months after the bottling, and the bottling is usually in March, spring, early spring, after the preceding harvest, not later than two years after the harvest. Uh, I could add that um, Muscadet, of course, uh, is the best well-known wine in the area. We also produce another wine, which is a bit drier, uh, called the Gros Plan, but definitely Moscoday is the wine of the people here. It came in the 17th century from Burgundy. There was a series of very strong frosts, winter frosts, and um, most people replaced the plants of the Gros Plan by the plants of the Moscoday. Uh, we know it is ideal with seafood, with fish, um, and um, if I could say something about the Loire Valley, Maybe that other areas have the grandeur, uh, but we have the charm, and that, I believe, is very important. While the vinification of Muscadet may seem straightforward, the agricultural tasks are just the same as in the Madoc. 
The Marquis says that the finished wine is ideal for fish, and it was Clemence, cook at the chateau a century ago, who invented Beurre Blanc, the classic sauce for fish. Micheline Lawton has another classic idea in mind. All along the Atlantic coast, we are having oysters, of course. We love oysters, and they are very good, but the, the Atlantic Sea is very good to breed some oysters. So here we have different sorts of oysters. We have the marraine, who are green. It's very easy to recognize them because they are green. We have little arcachon oysters. They can be bigger, but the small ones are especially delicious and exquisite. They have a very fresh and very delicate flavor. This is a fin de clair, fin de clair because the color is very, very light. This one being, again, a marraine, and this one, they are from Brittany, they are Quiberon oysters. And in the center, we have Bellon, and as you may know, Bellon were originally from Ireland. The tradition in Bordeaux is to have raw oysters with just a drop of lemon, and this is very typical of Bordeaux, with these little sauces called a crepinette. And if you want to make luxury, you have the crepinette uh, stuffed with truffles. But of course, what, we do, we, what should we drink with oysters? Maybe a muscadet from the Marquis de Goulaine. But here in Bordeaux, we would have a white calf. The best of the white calf being Aubryon, but that's great luxury. So you may have raw oysters, but you may cook the oysters, or grill the oysters, better to say that. And these oysters have been grilled with a little velouté, a little sauce. Of course, if you want to be very elegant, you drink the same wine that you have put in the velouté. But doing oysters with Aubryon would be a great luxury. You can also make the sauce, the velouté, with sauterne, then it's sweet. With a grave, it's a little drier, of course. And you can make soup and all sorts of other things with oysters. Everyone has oysters in the Bordeaux area. On Sunday, you find little shops along the road where you can buy oysters and just eat them along the road or on the beach. What a civilized idea. We tend to associate oysters with the beginning of a meal, but in the final program of the series, we'll be looking at a smooth finish, at fine cognacs and the wine geese families who produce them. Glasses of fine cognac, a sociable and traditional way to round off an evening and a fitting drink to follow a subtle bottle from one of the wine geese chateaux of Bordeaux with the crest of the West Cork Lawton family on the label. The brandy is Exo Grand Champagne from the House of Hennessy, founded by another Corkman, Richard Hennessy from Killavullen in North County Cork. Though the best known, the Hennessys were not the only Irish family to become involved in the cognac business. The Delamaines and Eckshaws, both from Dublin, also became highly respected in the Charant. The Bordelais Irish families, the Lawtons, Galways, Johnsons, Bartons, Phelans, the McCarthys and so on, while adventurous in many respects, were content with their lot. Their businesses on the Quai de Chartres, on the banks of the Gironde and the city of Bordeaux and further down river to the north in the classic wine-growing area of the Madoc. Without a bridge until 1821, the river was intimidating. 
and while many Irish priests crossed it to minister, there's no trace of the Irish families having left their mark on the culture of the vineyards across the river in St. Emilion. This medieval town, overlooking the surrounding vineyards of Fronsac, Pomerol, and the Coto of Burg and Bly. Localities with names to match a respectable wine cart in any restaurant. Indeed, one of the world's most distinguished red wines comes from near here, the fabulously expensive Chateau Petrousse. A celebrated area, but shunned by the immigrant wine geese and their descendants. We have to travel farther north to the rolling forested terrain of the Charente region before we rediscover a strong Irish influence. This is Hennessy territory and the country of Exshaw and Delamain. The business is brandy, the region is cognac. Richard Hennessy must have found something familiar here when he arrived from the home estate of Ballymacmoy in Cork. When all said and done, wine growing is just another way of farming and he was accustomed to the cycle of growing and harvesting before he began soldiering in Dillon's regiment. Down the years, the family has gathered many properties, and these vines at Le Peu are receiving a springtime inspection by the latest Richard Hennessy, Maurice Richard. Many generations away from Killavullen, Maurice is an executive in the firm whose family name has become almost synonymous with cognac and brandy. The Irish cannot claim to have invented brandy. It was the Dutch. They were great consumers of the local white wines and resented the cost of transporting large volumes on the voyage to the East Indies, even the expensive journey to Holland. By distillation, volumes were reduced and the shipping bill cut to one-sixth, a nectar distilled from necessity. This was the process on which Richard Hennessy founded his fortune. Richard Hennessy, who started the firm of Hennessy, came from County of Cork in the mid-18th century. And he started the firm of Hennessy in 1765, and I'm the eighth generation descendant of um, Richard. He was a wild goose, and he escaped Ireland as being a Catholic, started this firm, and of course, since then, uh, his descendants were not only businessmen, négociants, distillateurs, selling cognac and traveling the world, but they also were involved in local politics. Uh, they were deputies, they were senators, they were mayors. Uh, some of them were horse breeders and they were very successful uh, horse breeders. I mean, they, till uh, these modern years, we also carry on sponsoring ra racing in Dublin or in uh, Newbury in England, in, in other parts of the world, in France too. So my family has been really in all kind of ways of life and um, they still run the company Hennessy. This is large-scale production of the spirit of cognac, burnished copper stills to create an image of the drink for visitors. But the warmth and character of fine cognac comes from the eau de vie produced in the thousands of small stills bubbling and dripping their precious water of life in sheds and cellars all over the Charente. It's a delight to discover that the creation of one of the world's celebrated spirit drinks is a cottage industry, benefiting from all the care and handcrafting that small-scale production entails. The distillation season begins when the white wine has fermented in November and must finish by the following April, and all the great cognac houses buy from these small producers. The result of all this care and attention is a colourless, highly perfumed and feisty fire water, a long way from the smooth amber-coloured cognac marketed by Patrick Perillon of the House of Delamar. We are now in Boudeville, which is a small village right in the centre of the Grand Champagne district, which is the best part of the cognac area. And we are in a distillery which belongs to Mr. Longeville, who is a farmer who distills himself his own production. And we have here a traditional pot still, which is used if we were in the cognac district. And uh, basically, so the wine stays in the preheater, which is at the top of the pot still, then it gets down into the still itself and is boiled with a naked flame. And then the vapors of the wine go through the swan neck. There is a pipe which goes through the preheater and then goes into the coil 
and you've got the result of the first distillation, which is called the brouillis. And the brouillis has a strength of about 30% alcohol. And the result of this first distillation is then put back again into the still. It is distilled in the same way, and this is what we call la bonne chauffe, or the good heat. And in fact, it is at that time that you need the skill of the distiller so that it gets rid of the heads and of the tails of the distillation to keep only the heart, which after that will be aged and will give the cognac. Aging, the transition from the heart of the spirit to fine cognac. The alchemy of this transformation is compounded from timber and time, up to 60 years in casks made from oak, weathered and seasoned for six years before cask making begins. Matching the skill of the distillers are the more physical, robust crafts of the cask maker. Age-old manual process is aided by technology and machinery only when it cannot interfere with the traditional fashioning of the cask. No nails, no magic modern adhesives. Dowels and flattened rushes for a watertight lid. Timber, fire and iron fused and forged with a multiplicity of skills to make a container with all the qualities of a piece of fine furniture. Oak against oak, unadulterated by fastenings, is most important to the maturing of the cognac. The timber surrenders tannin and colour to the spirit and allows a slow, gentle oxidation to take place as the cognac ages. The final touch to the pristine cask is the addition of soft, supple hoops of chestnut wood. A fast food to tempt the woodworm away from years of active burrowing into the precious limousin oak. When the eau de vie is introduced into the oak casks, the charm and character of the Finnish cognac begins to emerge under the caring and watchful eye of the cellar master. Even the water used to tame the fiery eau de vie is aged in oak vats. Nothing is left to chance, nothing is added. Stillness and silence broken only by the cellar master's mallet as the bung of the cask is popped and the Prouvette dipped to check the maturation process. To ensure that the contents of all the casks mature in a controlled way, the front row of the Hennessy team constantly move the casks to different positions in the cellar. A spell on the floor or close to the door is followed by stacking up high, deep in the dark interior of the building. As the timber allows the spirit to breathe and evaporate, vapour passes up into the atmosphere and this encourages the growth of a minute fungus which coats the roofs and walls of buildings where cognac is stored. Evaporation at this stage means that the equivalent of 20 million bottles of brandy are lost each year. The industry cheerfully refers to this loss as the angel's share. The angels in the church of Saint-Pierre in Jarnac are well positioned to receive their share. High above the house of Delama, with its enormous range of spirits of different ages and origins. 
many of these precious cognacs will be combined and blended with younger spirits until the age, bouquet and flavour is obtained appropriate to the quality being sought. Delamar, pale and dry, vesper and so on. This is the singular virtue of cognac. The spirit doesn't need to be doctored as happens with so many other brandies. Mm, Cognac is a quality product, redolent of the many skills and traditional techniques that go into its making. This is reflected in the packaging. Labels applied by hand and squared with a wooden spatula. Sealing wire is twisted on and there's a constant polishing of the unblemished bottles. When this consignment leaves Delamar in Jarnac, it may be out of sight, but it will not be out of mind. And so here we are now in the office of our cellar master, where we keep samples of every export that we do, so that if ever there is a complaint, we can easily check the bottle and see what is the defect or not. During the aging process, it would be a catastrophe if any confusion arose over the source and age of the cognac in the casks. Computerization has a role to play in tracking of this, but Hennessy's pride themselves on the quality of the calligraphy used to identify their thousands of casks. So as you can see, you have a certain amount of information written on the side of a barrel. They are written in chalk, very traditionally. This, 1885, this is the year where the cognac was made. GC means Grand Champagne. It is coming from the Grand Champagne region of cognac. This means Yvon. It is the family which actually distilled this cognac. And their family has been selling to us for at least 200 years. And AS means Ancien Stock. And at Hennessy, we have only one tierçon of this 1885 cognac, which means 540 liters. The casual drinker can probably name half a dozen cognacs, but there are about 250 proprietary brands available in the area. How does one know what to choose? Is the age important or the locality? Is any one house preeminent? Alain Delamar and Patrick Perillong test their cognacs and blends every morning at 11 o'clock and take personal responsibility for their product. But what should the shopper or the person in the restaurant look out for? There must be some basic classification to follow. The classification in cognac, it's very easy. It's a geological classification. In fact, we have a very uh, chalky part in cognac and a clay part in cognac. So the classification follows the soil. First, you have the Grand Champagne, which is very, very chalky. That's the, the center part of the cognac. Then you have the Petit Champagne surrounding the Grand Champagne. Then you have the Bordery. And then the clay starts, and you have the fin bois, the bon bois, and the bois ordinaire. And of course, when you, you look to a label to, to see the, the, the quality of a cognac, you can look where the cognac comes from, and it, if it's come from Grand Champagne, you are sure to get the best. The cognac area covers about uh, 85,000 hectares, only planted with uh, vine, of course. And on that part, we have about uh, 30,000 growers. The average size of the vineyard will be three hectares only. Some of them will have uh, 15, 20, but most of them will have a small acreage. 30,000 growers, of whom about uh, 12,000 will distill themselves their own crop of wine. Some of them uh, will try to, to sell immediately the, the, the production of young cognac. And the richer, of course, uh, we will, uh, will try to keep part for their own stock. And of course, uh, through the years, this stock increases in value. So it's a good investment for them. The apparent timelessness okay. of cognac production has not impeded computerization and the introduction of modern business methods. 
Old high desks have been modified to accommodate VDUs. In all the great houses, including Delamar, there's a great sense of tradition, a great sense of history. Well, this is the, the Delamar coat of arms. It's just three red crossed on a field or with an eagle above. It was given by the King Charles I of England to Nicolas de Lamain, who was the first de Lamain, in fact, to go to England. He went there in 1625. He married there. And then he was sent to Dublin around uh, 1650. And they settled in Dublin for one, two, three, four, five generations. The, the, the father of the Delamain who came back to France was called uh, William. He had a title, I don't know what it is, uh, exactly what it means. He was Marshal of Dublin. He was living in, in the castle of Dublin. His wife was uh, called uh, Anna O'Shaughnessy. And uh, they had only one son. This son, James Delamain, came back to France in uh, 1760. He was uh, lucky enough to marry the only daughter of Monsieur Ranson. And Monsieur Ranson was a cognac shipper in Jarnac. And so the firm start as Ranson and de la main, and so on and so on. But there was already uh, an Irishman in, uh, in cognac come, uh, called uh, Saul. And then the, the, the Hennessy family followed, of course, with uh, Richard Hennessy. And uh, it is said in the family that James uh, de la main helped a lot uh, Richard Hennessy to start his own uh, business. And in fact, Richard Hennessy was also helped by uh, Samuel Turner, who was uh, born in Dublin too. And this Samuel Turner was a nephew of uh, James de la main. So we had in, in Cognac at the end of the 18th century quite a lot of Irish people, not connected, no family connection, but uh, a friendly, very friendly connection. Maybe one, one point which is uh, important for the history of uh, Ireland, the brother of uh, William was called Henri, Captain Henri de la Main, and he built the Delft manufacture in Dublin. And of course, they start uh, manufacture a lot of Delft pottery, plates, jugs, and uh, which are of course very much looked after now by antiques collector. And they are, they cost a lot of money, of course. But now the the, the name de la main is um, extinguished. We have a few spots still in, in Ireland called de la main in Kinvara. We have uh, de la main lodge. And of course, in your museum, you have a lot of uh, Delamain plates, so that's remained something. A tribute to the Irish families is the survival of the businesses through revolution, depression, war, and the many vicissitudes across the years. Hennessy is very strong, indeed ubiquitous in cognac, but Exshaw has been bought out by Otar, who in turn were taken over, and there's a blurring of identity as smaller houses are subsumed into larger organizations or multinationals. Monsieur Yorick Exshaw is the last member of the family to have run the business founded by John Exshaw from Dublin. When John was about nine years old, he came to Bordeaux to visit his uncle, the Chevalier Nérac, who were bankers and uh, also in the shipping trade in Bordeaux. And from Bordeaux, he went to join his mother at Mauritius. Later, when he was 20 or 22, he came back to Bordeaux. Then he established himself and uh, Afterwards, he married with Mrs. Miss Corinne Gaetier of the very well-known family, Gaetier family in, in the wine trade. He died in uh, 1847, and he left his firm to his eldest son, Thomas Henry Exho, who was then my great-grandfather. 
he developed that firm very much. And in fact, Thomas Henry was the first to send bottle, cognac bottle in India. There was not the is there was not the Canal de Suez at that time. The, the goods used to travel on the Isthme de Suez on uh, camel's back. After my great grandfather, it was his three sons, Henry, the eldest, Yorick, my grandfather, and William, the youngest. Afterwards, the firm was run by Noel and Richard and my father, but my father died very young at 46 because he had been very severely wounded during the First World War. Personally, I was in the firm with a cousin of mine called Henry Eggshaw too, and uh, until we sold it to Otar. Our main uh, markets had been India before the prohibition, uh, also Malaya, Singapore, Hong Kong, and in the past there was a large market in China. It used to be said that Eckshaw's success in the Orient was because the name was easy to pronounce, like Rickshaw. Cognac now is the prestigious drink in the East, with the Japanese major consumers of fine champagne cognac, and splendid facilities have been provided to entertain international buyers. Local authorities, some cognac houses, and local industries have come together to build a magnificent golf course on land provided by the House of Martel at one of their chateaux. Vineyards provide a novel hazard, and the elegant clubhouse is a renovated stable on the banks of the meandering Charente. A little further upriver on the same bank of the Charente, the Hennessy family maintains the charming Chateau Bagnolet in which to entertain and influence important customers. Among antique Hennessy furnishings, and in such a location, clients must be impressed. Much of the character of the Cognac region derives from the river, but the contemporary charm conceals its earlier importance as a routeway into the region from the ports of Rochefort and La Rochelle. Now a popular recreation centre, La Rochelle was a significant port for trading with Ireland, particularly Dublin and the south coast harbours of Yall, Cork and Kinsale. In the 18th century, this would have been the convenient port for Richard Hennessy, en route from his Ballymacmoy estate in Kilavullen on the Munster Blackwater, to the more substantial property of La Billiandry on the Charente. The Eckshaws would have come here on their way to Cognac from central Dublin, and the Delamains from their Irish properties like Delamain Lodge in Canvara to the charming town of Jarnac. The Irish families arrived in Cognac with distinguished reputations in agriculture and business, as well as public service and military brilliance. From the 17 and 1800s, these families have enriched the community of Charant in so many ways. Successful in business since first they strode the 18th century streets of Cognac, they've influenced many aspects of life. Richard Hennessy founded the firm, and his successor, his son James, was elected to the Chamber of Deputies. A Hennessy was Minister for Agriculture, and another an ambassador. The Eckshaws were pioneers in international export strategy, even overcoming the Napoleonic blockades by using American flags of convenience on their ships. And the Delamans provided French science and letters with archaeologists, historians, editors, publishers, and influential natural historians. 
there's a rare French orchid name for the family, Dactylares delamanii. All of that and their sublime spirits and wines.